Hi everyone, I'm Nikki Jovakik from Lookup Strata and for today's webinar session we happily welcome Alison Benson from Karen Benson Lawyers. This New South Wales webinar is about strata renovations and what you can and cannot do without Owners Corporation approval. Alison will be talking about the three levels of approval for works in strata schemes, plus tips on how to streamline your renovation approval application. And this will be followed by some discussion and also some Q&As. Before we begin, I'd like to mention that the information contained in the session, including the discussions that arise from submitted questions, is not legal advice and should never not be relied upon as legal advice. You should seek independent advice before acting on the information contained in today's session. We thank Alison Benson from Karen Benson Lawyers for joining us today. Alison is a strata and community titles lawyer who has provided general advice, acted in disputes, including building defect disputes, and worked with clients in preparing and enforcing bylaws and strata management statements since 2008. Since 2012, Alison has acted exclusively in all facets of strata and community association and building and construction matters. Alison seeks to provide pragmatic advice in a straightforward manner, focusing on the needs of her clients and the cost effective resolution of each matter. A regular author of blogs and blogs on her thoughts of a strata lawyer blog, Alison has recently assisted in the lawfully explained initiative of the New South Wales, Queensland and Victorian Law Societies by taking taking part in two podcasts on property law, which are, which are available on Listener. We'll share the link to Alison's blog in the email that we send out later today. And Alison and the team at Karen Benson Lawyers are longtime contributors and supporters of Lookup Strata. They regularly provide very informative and timely blog articles, which assists our New South Wales readers with answers to their strata questions. This is the first webinar Alison has joined us for. However, last year we were joined by Christopher Karen from Karen Benson Lawyers also for a thought provoking webinar for our ACT and New South Wales viewers, helping lot owners deal with strata building defects. And Karen Benson Lawyers have published over a hundred articles on the Look Up Strata blog. This content reaches thousands of our readers and therefore assists thousands of lot owners and strata managers every month. We thank Alison and Karen Benson Lawyers, the team for their ongoing support and assistance to the Look Up Strata community and I'm going to leave you now with Alison to carry out the presentation. I'll be chatting with you in blog so say hi to me there and welcome to today's uh, webinar Alison and thank you so much for joining us. Hi thanks Nikki. Um, now thank you to everybody that's attending and Nikki I'm so glad you're monitoring chat because that is blowing up over there <laughs> so I will leave that to you. Um, so those of you that know me and there have been a few familiar names popping out there um, will know that I tend to be quite informal. Um, you can see that I'm sharing my screen at the moment. Um, I'm going to try not to use any of those bad words and restrict it to gosh darn and damn. Um, they can be very, very bad words. Uh, technology is not my friend is the caveat I give to everybody. Um, I say that because although I seem to be okay at it um, while not on a presentation, uh, it doesn't seem to like helping me during presentations. So let's see how we go here. Uh, I am just going to put this into slideshow mode for you so that you can all see the, the presentation and see it properly. And it's great to be here because one of my absolute passions is I love working with people of all different sorts, sizes, shapes, whatever, um, and helping them with their problems. But I also like helping educate people about what you can and can't do in strata land. Um, and when I say strata land, I should also say community titles as well. I do tend to, to lump everybody in together, um, which is probably not the best, um, but please don't feel uh, that I am not um, also trying to help those of you who are sitting out there in community, neighbourhood or precinct associations. So, to get on with today's topic, we're talking about what you can and can't do without owner's corporation's approval uh, in renovations. Um, so let's just move forward. What are the rules? Um, and this, this is going to be a very broad guide for you, but some but not all renovations are going to need the approval of the owner's corporation or of your owner's corporation. So it's really, really important that you know what level of approval that you need. And my overriding um, position, and I hope that you will take it from this particular seminar, is it is so much less risky to seek, seek the permission to do the work first 
rather than try and seek forgiveness uh, and ratification of your work afterwards. Why? Because I would have oh, at least at least twice a week people coming to me saying, oh, look, I'm in a little bit of trouble. Um, I just went and I just, just did a couple of things uh, and now my owner's corporation is, is coming at me. And when you, you ask, you know, so, okay, what did you do? Some of these things, some of them are small. Some of them can be things like, in one instance, uh, deciding to gut the apartment, including all structural walls, uh, causing a lovely sag in the roof. Um, so much, much less risky to seek permission first. It may add a couple of steps at the start, and often case it does, uh, but taking a little bit of time before you do something uh, can definitely save you a lot of time, money, and stress afterwards. Um, so for those of you out there that sew, uh, what do you do? You measure once? No, you measure twice and you cut once. Why? Because you can only cut once. So make sure you've got it correct and then jump ahead and do it is my advice. Okay, the do's. We're getting all our duckies in a row. Uh, if you want to renovate, well, then my recommended steps to you, check your strata plan. Do you know what your lot property is versus what the common property is? Uh, and why do I say that? Because in strata uh, schemes in New South Wales, it's work that affects the common property uh, that is going to require the owner's corporation's permission. Um, and so if you are doing work that is within your lot, um, then oftentimes you actually don't need uh, permission. So for instance, uh, I want to, um, I've got a, a dropped ceiling, for instance, uh, and on my strata plan, the dropped ceiling is actually in my lot because this is a false ceiling and I've got another proper ceiling on top of that. And this is where the, the common property is. And this is the lot property airspace. So if I wanted to hang something from my ceiling, provided you couldn't see it from outside, um, it's not going to affect anything structural because it's on this false ceiling. And I'd be able to do that. Um, so check and understand what your lot property is and what the common property is. Check your schemes bylaws, step number two. If you are in a stratum development, um, you need to also check your building management statement. It might also be called a strata management statement. Why do I say this? Because quite often, if you're in one of these larger planned communities that have stratum lots, um, and it, there may be one or more strata schemes, uh, or if you are in a, uh, a more recent um, scheme, then you will have a general bylaw that covers work conditions. Um, and it might be things like if you're in a stratum development, that there's an architectural and landscaping guideline that you have to abide by. Uh, if you were in just a single strata scheme, oftentimes you'll see that there's going to be a general works bylaw. And oftentimes it'll say, um, you know, this is the approach. This is how you come to the, the strata committee and the secretary. Um, this is the information that we need for your application. Um, and it might be things like the plans, uh, a statement from a structural engineer, uh, it might be a copy of the development consent. Um, so there's a nice little pack that you send to your, your strata committee. So just check and see. The general bylaw might also already cover the specific type of work that you want to do. So if there is a bylaw to that extent, you'll need to read it and then see what steps you need to follow. Oftentimes, it's just that you have to give your written consent to abiding by the conditions under that bylaw. Sometimes, there might be a little template bylaw uh, and it says, here are the general work conditions. Things like you've got to provide all your insurances, uh, the licenses of the contractors, any required consents from council or other consent authorities. Um, you have to abide by the um, National Construction Code. Uh, if there's a requirement to get any plans under the Design and Building Practitioners Act, you have to comply with that. Um, you know, this is how you'll take out your garbage and dispose of it or waste from the, the work. Uh, this is the hours that you can work in. And this is sort of the time frames um, for which work once started needs to be completed. And then at the very bottom, there may be a template bylaw. And all you might need to do is fill out the work you need to do and then put that specific bylaw to the owner's corporation. So just double check. You could already have authorization to do the work but you need to check. 
if the work says, for instance, and it's very, very common to have a specific um, bathroom works bylaw, but that might say that you can take out all the fixtures and fittings uh, and you can take out the tiling, take out the waterproofing, replace the waterproofing, replace the, the tiling and replace the fixtures and fittings. But what happens if you want to move the shower from one corner of the room to stick it in another corner of the room? Well, you would actually have to change the drainage flows and that may not be covered in the specific bylaw. So just double check. Um, the other third point you need to do, and I use this as the last point because the first two points are very specific to your properties. The third point is specific for all schemes in New South Wales. And this is the three tier scheme and it covers works under the Strata Schemes Management Act. So what does that actually say? Hopefully you can read our Do I Need a Bylaw flowchart. Uh, if not, it is going to be one of the documents that's provided in the links. Uh, and there's two sides to this uh, flowchart. I've just extracted the, the front page, which is a little flowchart itself. On the back is actually a list of the work that is covered under the Act uh, and the regulations that comes under the various categories. So the first tier, which is the simplest tier, uh, is covered under Section 109 of the Strata Schemes Management Act, and it's cosmetic work. And cosmetic work, as you think, uh, well, we're not going to be doing anything too major. We've put a little bit of makeup on to, uh, to make the, the lot look a little bit better. So we'll be doing things like replacing or installing built-in wardrobes, um, doing some painting, although I do put a caveat on that one later, laying carpet, uh, installing or replacing handrails, for instance, or I want to stick a picture up. I'm going to stick a hook on the wall. So this level, this is all cosmetic type of work. Now, the Act doesn't um, exclude items. It's actually uh, quite inclusive because it actually says cosmetic work is including the work that you can see up on the slide, but it doesn't limit it to. So for instance, you might say, well, it says I can replace a hook, a nail or a screw for hanging paintings or other things on the walls. Well, I want to actually um, you know, do a, um, a piece of work and what I'm going to do is uh, hang, I don't know, I'm just trying to think of a good example, uh, but I'm trying to, to hang something else on the wall. It's not a hook or a nail or a screw, um, but I'm going to put it into the wall and it's going to have the same effect. Um, so that would be considered to be cosmetic work as well. Okay, filling minor holes and cracks in the internal walls. Again, cosmetic work. We're just patching up. We'll put, we're putting our makeup on our lot. Um, says the person who doesn't wear makeup. Um, so probably the wrong, wrong, wrong analogy to use there. But essentially think of it as things like makeup, makeup for your unit. What is the second category? And this is a little bit more serious work. It's called minor renovations under the Act uh, and section 110, some section three deals with it. Uh, and it's things like renovating a kitchen, installing or replacing wood or other hard surface floors, installing a reverse cycle split system air conditioning system or reconfiguring non-structural walls. This type of work, unlike cosmetic work, requires approvals. Um, and what is the approval? Well, again, just double check your bylaws. Why? Because your owner's corporation may have delegated the power to approve this type of work to your strata committee and there should be a bylaw that would reflect that delegation. If it hasn't, um, then you would have to go to a general meeting and you'd have to get the approval of the general meeting. The good news is, though, that this is only an ordinary resolution. So 51% um, basically of the people in attendance uh, or lots, I should say, in attendance and eligible to vote would have to agree to do the work. So it's a much simpler um, way to get approval than it used to be under the old Act. Um, if your strata committee has been delegated the power, again, it's a simple majority. So 51% of the strata committee have to agree to have the work done. Um, now, there are conditions in the Act um, about minor renovations. Uh, and essentially, it's it's very, very similar to what you'd see in normal works bylaws that um, you have to apply. Um, approval can be given by either the strata committee if it's been delegated the power or the owner's corporation uh, and that you have to do the work um, in effectively a sensible manner. You have to comply with the National Construction Code. 
um, you're liable for the work that you do. So very, very sensible things under the Act. So the third category of work, this is the much more serious work. Um, and why do I say that? Well, because it involves things that can cause a lot of problems if they go wrong, or alternatively, cause a lot of contention in the owner's corporation. Um, this work is all under section 110, subsection 7 of the Act. And this work requires authorisation by way of a bylaw, which means a special resolution of the owner's corporation at a general meeting. So effectively, 75% of the unit entitlements that are present and eligible to vote have to vote in favour of it. There is a caveat to that. I'm going to get to it in the next slide. I'm going to go back to the type of work this is. When I said it was more serious work, it's things involving structural changes. So when I said the, um, the bathroom before, you know, you might have a bathroom works bylaw that's already in place for your scheme, but that particular work that you want to do involves moving a drainage pipe. And so you have to cut chasings through the floor, um, which is the structural slab, which all of the other units rest upon. Well, that would be structural work. So that type of work is going to need a specific bylaw if there isn't one already in place. Waterproofing work. Um, why? Is it included? Well, most of the problems, I'd say the vast majority of problems I have come to me involve waterproofing in one way, shape, form or another. Um, one of the most contentious areas of renovations um, is definitely waterproofing. And I would always recommend um, when you're getting a bylaw for waterproofing that you require the waterproofing certificates be provided to the owners corporation so that they've got evidence it was done uh, and evidence of uh, who that particular lot owner can go um, and sue if required if the waterproofing does fail it also means that the owners corporation then has a record of when that waterproofing work was done but as I said waterproofing work like structural changes you're going to need a bylaw for approval um, Work that requires any other form of consent under another act, such as a development consent, or work that changes the external appearance of a law, well, that also needs to have a bylaw to pass this work. Um, and that's when I was talking about painting before. That is a bit of a carve out because although painting of your law is cosmetic work, you need to be careful because does that change the external appearance of your law? Well, Pretty much every lot has windows. I don't know that I know a lot that doesn't unless it's a storage lot. Um, so technically, opening your blinds uh, would change the appearance of a lot if you've painted your lot. If you can see my lovely orange wall behind me, or I would prefer to be a little bit fancier and say terracotta. Um, but if I wanted to change my wall uh, from orange to blue, then if I open my windows, technically it changes the external appearance of my lot. Most schemes aren't that pedantic. You know, if I wanted to just simply repaint it with a very, very similar colour, who, who is going to pick up that that has changed the external appearance of my lot? Not many people. Not many people are going to care. But if, and I have had this situation, where the lot included a balcony uh, and the lot owner decided to paint the balcony, um, so the walls of the balcony, uh, they were currently a white, off-white, beige colour. Uh, they were painted bright purple. That caused a lot of contention in this scheme. And I can see why I, I w actually went out to the scheme and you could see this balcony from miles away. It really did stand out. So there we've actually got a breach of the act. Um, because it did painting the walls, although technically could be cosmetic work. In this case, it wasn't because it changed the external appearance of a lot. It, it really did stand out. Um, you would also have an issue with uh, the model by law for most schemes, which is doing things or, or not uh, doing things in your lot that uh, would uh, affect the look and feel of the building. So in that particular case, there was two causes of action against that lot owner. Uh, they hadn't approved their purple painting uh, and they certainly had changed the external appearance of a building. Uh, they thought it was lovely. Uh, not many other people did, let me just say. Uh, now, I was talking to you before about bylaws 
and requiring a special resolution of the owners corporation at a general meeting. And that is almost always 75% of the unit entitlements present and eligible to vote, voting in favour of your bylaw. There is a carve out, as there always is, because in Stradaland, we like our carve outs. What is it? Well, there's a new section um, or new part to section six of the Strata Management Act. Uh, and it changes the definition of a special resolution when that definition uh, or when that resolution, I should say, uh, is in relation to sustainability infrastructure. And if that motion is in relation to sustainability infrastructure, well, then a special resolution means only 51% of the unit entitlements have to vote in favour for it. So keep in mind, if you're doing work, um, if it may be slightly contentious, um, you might want to split your sustainability infrastructure work from the contentious work. Why? Because sustainability infrastructure work, it's easier to get approval for and it's easier to get your bylaw passed. So, for instance, I want to renovate my bathroom. Um, I, I know there's been problems in the scheme um, and bathrooms are a really contentious issue. Um, and I'm doing a few things that, look, I know that the owners corporation might be a little bit uh, anxious about because of previous problems. So for instance, in renovating my bathroom, I've decided I'm knocking down a couple of structural walls uh, to create a lovely ensuite for myself. Um, that work might be contentious. So you might want to have a bylaw to, or a motion for a bylaw to pass that work. But I also want, because I'm doing work, I'm getting disrupted. I want to get a solar panel installed for my lot at the same time. Well, a solar panel would actually be a sustainability infrastructure. Why? I won't read it for you, but you can see it on the screen that sustainability infrastructure is things that are obviously going to be environmentally friendly, such as solar panels, uh, could be batteries, um, anything to reduce water or increase efficiency, for instance. So I know that I might not get approval to do all of the bathroom work I want to do, um, so I need to consider, do I then go, oh, I really want, because we all know electricity bills are going up, um, do I want to get my solar panel in regardless of whether I do my bathroom work or am I going to tie the two together? If you tie the two together in the same bylaw, you're going to have to have 75% because you're mixing the types of work that you want to do. Um, so the bathroom works with sustainability infrastructure works. Um, but if you split the two and have two bylaws, you're very, very likely, or much, much more likely, because you only need 51% of the unit entitlements voting in favour of it to get your um, solar panel bylaw up. Okay, so that was the carve out. This strange uh, provision where if it involves sustainability infrastructure, it's much, much easier to get your bylaw and your special resolution through. So you've seen all my ticks. Couple more ticks. And these are really, I suppose, my... Trips and oh, tricks and traps for people in strata land. If you need to ask for approval for minor renovations, um, and remember, cosmetic work does not need approval, but if you need approval for the minor renovations, then ask your strata manager for assistance in drafting a resolution to approve it. Um, if you're in doubt, I've put a basic resolution or wording of basic resolution there. Of course, you have to tailor it to um, what you want to actually do. So annex your quotation or plans and describe your work, put your lot number in. Um, but that it would be or would suffice whether or not it's a strata committee um, approval, whether they've been delegated the power or whether it has to go to the owners corporation. Um, but your strata manager is a great source of information. Uh, and I think a lot of people don't use them um, as much as they could. Um, and look, I know that our strata managers are super duper busy. Um, we're all getting um, you know, so many more emails, I think, than we ever used to um, and so many more phone calls. Um, but if you have a good relationship with your strata manager or if you want to keep a good fitting with your owners corporation, just check with your strata manager. You can propose the motion that I put there um, to make their life a little easier if they don't have a standard one. Okay. Second tip is ask your strat your contractor to give you a fulsome list of the work and ignore my spelling mistake there, a fulsome um, that you want to complete. 
If they can't do that, quite frankly, I'd be asking why, um, but I'd ask for a detailed quote um, or I'd ask for plans, particularly if I'm doing things like, as I said before, I'm going back to my example, um, moving a shower from one end of the bathroom to the other end of the bathroom, because it, it will give a picture speaks a thousand words. It gives a really good, clear idea of what you want to do. So we are talking about minor renovations. I did talk about showers and moving drainage points, which would not be a minor renovation, but it's a good example to use. If your contractor can give you that information, you can then actually sit down and using the, the flow chart that we've given you, you can figure out whether this is actually going to be minor renovation or whether it's going to require a bylaw itself. So ask questions of your contractors, um, get them to put it in writing for you. If the work um, is going to be removing walls, for instance, um, or cutting chasings through floors or through walls. Um, and chasings are what you put in a wall, basically, to put in wires and cabling or pipes. Um, so things, you, you use it when you're changing um, around electricity services, training, uh, changing piping or drainage systems. Um, so if they can put it in writing, your contractor it is, um, that it doesn't involve waterproofing, the works that you need to do, um, and it doesn't uh, include structural elements, well then give that to your owner's corporation because then you've got an expert, which is a building contractor, saying that this work is not going to be waterproofing or structural and it makes it much more likely that your owner's corporation would approve that work as minor renovations. If, of course, they do come back and they say that it does involve structural work or it does involve waterproofing, for instance, well, then you're going to need a bylaw. My next pro tip was ask your strata manager whether they've got a recommended lawyer to use. Oftentimes they do. Um, some strata managers um, will, you know, basically say, we don't care who you use. Um, but a lot of them will say, look, the owners co corporation prefers X, Y, Z lawyers. Um, if you go to those lawyers, the chances are because the owners corporation is familiar with them, uh, and is familiar with the terms of their bylaws, um, it would make it a lot easier to get past. Um, I'm often asked to review bylaws from other lawyers. Um, when it's from another strata lawyer, I just need to know the name of who, do, who prepared the bylaw. Uh, and then I can essentially just go straight to the causes that I, I've had issues with in the past uh, and have a look um, and then negotiate some, some workarounds. Uh, when I get bylaws that have been drafted by a committee or drafted by a lot owner um, or a lawyer that doesn't necessarily practice day to day in this space um, or worse, uh, a bylaw that cut and pastes from other uh, people's bylaws uh, but hasn't actually tailored anything, that's when you know it, it starts getting tricky um, and you're much, much, much more likely to have the owners corporation say, look, We've got your bylaw. We're not entirely happy with it. We want to send it out to a strata lawyer to get them to review it for us. Um, and that will be at your cost. Um, that's much more likely to happen, which is why I always say, ask your strata manager if they can recommend a lawyer or lawyers um, and then use those people. Um, it just makes it easier in the long run. Now, second pro tip, give the lawyer full details of the work that you want to do. Um, and a copy of the registered bylaws for your scheme. Why? Because they'll actually go and check those registered bylaws uh, and they'll see if the work that you want to do has already been authorised somewhere. They'll also have a look to see if there's any model bylaws uh, with terms and conditions that are to be standard for your scheme and they'll incorporate it into their bylaw that they're drafting for you. Now, preferably, you'll also give them the plans detailing the works and if there's going to be structural works, uh, a letter or a certificate from a structural engineer saying that if the works are done in accordance with their plans, the work won't affect the structure of the building or adversely affect the structure of the building. Why do I say give the lawyer all that? Well, the lawyer is acting for you. It is their job to try and provide a fulsome bylaw that protects you, um, but it will also conversely protect your owner's corporation because it will say... Uh, work A, B and C is authorised, but it'll only authorise A, B and C work. If you then go and say, well, 
I'm going to do D as well. That's not authorised under the bylaw. Okay, so you need to tell the lawyers what you're going to, to do. And it's okay if you don't know exactly. Oftentimes we go back to people and say, look, we can see that uh, you're doing or you're taking out the shower and you're taking out the bath and it looks like you're only putting back a shower. What are you going to do with the bath um, and the drainage system for the bath? Oh, oh, well, I was going to install, you know, this high power jacuzzi uh, and I was going to stick it in there and I was going to go through the wall because we don't have enough room in the existing bathroom. Uh, and, you know, I was going to make this, you know, lovely big jacuzzi sauna spa area as part of my ensuite. And then sort of ears prick up and think, OK, well, we need to check the structural work if you're going to go through a wall. We also need to check that you've got sufficient drainage points. Uh, and whether you need to change any of the piping structure, um, meaning that we may need to have some, some chasings cut through floors, might also mean that you're waterproofing or need to waterproof an entirely new area of your lot. Um, so expect to have a few questions um, from your lawyers when they send you a, um, uh, a plan, have a look at it or a draft bylaw, have a look at it. And I put some considerations there as well. Um, I think I've covered the first one, which says, you know, does the work you want to do, does that mean that you're going to actually be changing any pipes, any drainage, any wiring? Are you going to be waterproofing an area that never, ever had waterproofing before? Or are you going to be taking up waterproofing from somewhere? Um, should you offer compensation? Um, so, for instance, a normal bathroom works by law. I wouldn't um, recommend it. Uh, but if you're going to renovate um, your balcony, for instance, and you also want to take um, as a part of that renovation the exclusive use of uh, a whole other part of the deck that is common property, well, then you might want to think about offering some compensation um, because you're actually gaining the use of that um, part of the deck that you didn't have before. And you should also consider, do I put in a bylaw and when I'm putting in the bylaw, do I need to go and get a complying development certificate for this work or do I need to put in a development application? In which case, strata committees can approve this type of work or approve the applications as long as they haven't been restricted from doing so at a general meeting. Um, so you could just ask the strata committee to approve it. But if the strata committee says, look, we're not comfortable with it, you might as well at the same general meeting when your bylaw is being put up, also put in your DA application for the owner's corpse approval um, to submit the DA um, or the complying development certificate. Um, and that way you sort of get a two for one uh, out of the meeting, if you like, and it doesn't delay your work. Third point, well, actually, I think this is the fourth point. Um, once the bylaw is drafted, I like to tell my clients to put together a little pack. Um, and that pack includes plans for the work, if they're not already annexed to the bylaw, which will then be annexed to the meeting notice, why you want to conduct the renovations. Um, because you're telling a little story here. Um, basically, we you can see that the large caps or, or large writing, the object is to make any refusal for your bylaw unreasonable. If you tell a story, you're much more likely to get your bylaw approved um, and to win the favour of other lot owners. And when I say tell a story, I'm not meaning, you know, kids coming home, running to mum and telling mum a story, uh, which is not true. Um, I don't mean it in that context. I mean, you're setting the scene for why you actually want to do this work. Um, so, for instance, look, the, the bathroom is, is 50 years old. It's that lovely shade of uh, pink and blue that you get in some of the older bathrooms uh, from the 50s and 60s. Uh, or it could be a lovely 70s, uh, 70s bathroom um, and it could have all sorts of fabulous colours and carpet, uh, for instance. I've seen those uh, in applications. Um, they are still around people. Um, so tell the story. Why do I want it? Well, the bathroom's 50 years old. Um, you know, here's a picture of it. Um, we want to update it so it's more modern. Um, it's getting too old, you know, that the shower screen's um, deteriorating. Um, we don't need a bath. It doesn't suit our modern lifestyle. Um, or we want to convert the laundry into an ensuite. Um, if you want to 
um, and I've had this, this, this was actually a genuine request from one of my clients that they actually wanted to um, put a, a glass covering um, over their courtyard. Why? Uh, because one of the, the lot owners um, had mobility issues and because of her mobility issues, really her home was her castle and she couldn't get out very much and she liked nothing more than being able to go out and sit in the courtyard. But because of her mobility issues, at the slightest hint of rain, it was just too slippery. Um, when there was a wind and there was leaves and sticks coming down, she'd slip, trip and fall. There was just, you know, it, it was too risky for her to use it. So they actually wanted a covering of their courtyard so that they'd stop the leaves coming down and twigs coming down and so that she could sit out there in the rain. Um, and I thought that was quite a nice way to say, well, look, we're not doing it um, for necessarily, you know, to, to improve our lot and to sell it. We're actually doing it to make it more livable for us and to meet our needs. Um, I'd also put in there what colours and what materials you want to use. Why? Because this can be a real source of contention. So say I, I want to put it in an awning. Um, well, what material do you want? Everybody else uses colour bond and it's this particular colour scheme. Um, but, you know, what do you want? Is it going to be something else? Is it going to be um, in uh, keeping with the rest of the building? Um, so put those details down because they're some of the big questions people get up to. It's not often I get asked about the technical details or my lot owners get asked about the technical details of their work, but they will get asked a lot of times about the look and feel of the work. Um, I'd also put in the little pack the contractor's details, their license numbers, their insurances, if you've already got that material. Um, and why? Then you can put all of that. It goes in with the meeting notice. Um, it gives your other lot owners um, a lot of information from which to make their decision uh, and information that's in your favour to make the decision as well because you've put in there real reasons for wanting it. And look, I know I said before it's, um, you know, uh, a bylaw to uh, for the covering was to make a, a courtyard more livable uh, and a lot more livable. Um, there's nothing wrong with saying, look, um, we want to update our apartment because it is really dated. Um, yes, there'll be an uplift in price because of that. People understand that. That's that's entirely normal. So there's nothing wrong with saying, look, it's tired, it's drab, we need an update. Um, okay, so putting together a little pack like that really does give the owners corporation much less reason to say no to your bylaw. Um, and that's important. Why? Because if you do have to get your work approved by way of a bylaw and the owner's corporation refuses to pass that bylaw, you've got an application in NCAT that the refusal was unreasonable. And if you can point to your pack and say, look, look at all the information tribunal member I provided, um, you know, I gave them everything with which to make their decision. Um, and, you know, they've now come and said that I didn't tell them that I was going to uh, do the work on a Tuesday. That's unreasonable. Um, I told them I was going to do it, you know, Monday through Friday. You can see that that would obviously include Tuesday. Silly example, but the more information you give them, um, the, the easier it is to say that a refusal was unreasonable. Okay, now we're going to the crosses, the don'ts. And this is the big stuff, okay? This is the stuff that causes grief, uh, that does, and oh, I'm be biased, you know, it does give strata lawyers work. Um, I'd be happy not to get this work, quite frankly. Um, I'd be happy to help people doing what they need to do because, as I said, if you get the approval in the first place, you can save yourself a lot of stress, a lot of time, and a lot of money um, at the back end. So these are the don'ts. Do not start work that requires an approval without obtaining the relevant approval. Why? You can find yourself the subject of a stop work order uh, and you can eventually be ordered to remove the work. So I gave an example before about a um, particular scheme and this, this has got to be the worst one I've ever seen, to be honest. Um, but it was the, the top floor of a unit. Um, those people who were experienced um, owners, corporation owners, uh, they had just decided that they were gutting their entire penthouse unit. Um, well, I don't know how they thought it wasn't going to be noticeable. One, there was jackhammering. Uh, two, they took out every single structural wall and just absolutely gutted it so it was a shell. Um, the roof 
had a distinct sag because it had no support. Um, and third point as to how, I don't know how they didn't think this would be noticed, they decided it was appropriate to jackhammer three core holes into the lot downstairs bathroom. Um, so you could literally look up if you were in the bathroom downstairs, straight up into the unit above that was in the process of being renovated. Um, so of course we ran to the tribunal and we got a stop work order. Um, and then we had to get orders to quickly patch these core holes so that the people downstairs could actually ooh, have a shower, go to the toilet because it was their only bathroom. Um, so that actually took um, about six months to get um, approval through because we did negotiate with them to get a bylaw in the end, um, but they had to stop work for about six months. Uh, and so that cost them time and money. And I have no doubt a great amount of stress. Okay, so don't start the work without approval. And some of those approvals too can be council approvals. Um, not all work's going to require council approval. Speak to your council town planning department if you're unsure or speak to your contractors um, if you're unsure. Second, don't. Do not discount the um, power of approaching your neighbours first. Why? You can discuss any concerns that they might have um, and you can gather support for your work. So, for instance, if you know that um, Alison from Unit 1, she works from home on a Wednesday. Um, well, I might be able to agree that we don't do any noisy work on a Wednesday. If we're going to do any um, power tool work, we'll do it on a Monday, Tuesday, and we'll get it all done. Uh, and then we'll try and do other work that's not so noisy on the Wednesday. And then we'll do noisy work again on the Thursday and Friday. Um, they might be concerned about how the contractors are going to park. Um, so you can say, well, okay, I'm going to have my car out of my car space and I'm going to tell my contractor to only park in my car space. So you can discuss any concerns that they have and you can put those in your bylaw, okay? And do not rush in and book a contractor. Why? Because until, if you need bylaw approval, um, or if you need the approval for a minor renovation, just a holding a strata committee meeting, it does take a little bit of time. It's only 72 clear hours notice or three days clear notice. But you've got, got to get the meeting notices out. You've got to get, have a time when your strata committee can actually meet. You've got to get the notices uh, prepared by your strata manager, not just get them out to the strata committee um, and to other lot owners where needed. If you have to hold a general meeting, well, then we're looking at about you know, probably about 20, 21 days before a general meeting can be held with all the notice requirements. If people have got to have notices sent out by mail, um, what happens then if the meeting does not approve your bylaw? Um, so don't book your contractor for the day after the meeting because your bylaw might not be approved, okay? Even if your bylaw is approved, registering your bylaw takes time. And that's really important because a bylaw is not effective until it is registered. Um, so if you start work before the bylaw is registered, you can run the risk that for some reason it is actually never registered. Um, and if it's not registered in time, you've only got six months to register it, then your bylaws lapsed and you've actually got no approval to do this work. Now, it's a rare case that this happens, but it does happen. And you know, why doesn't it get registered? Well, it can be all sorts of things. It could be that um, you know, you're a self-managed scheme, whoever was your secretary just forgot to do it or didn't know how to do it or did it one day late. Um, it could be your strata manager um, didn't do it, uh, didn't have the, um, the bylaws consolidated. By the time they got the bylaws consolidated, the new bylaw added, the six months were over. Uh, it could be that they decided to wait because there was another general meeting. That general meeting um, was postponed. They forgot that they had to register your bylaw and then the six months has lapsed. Um, all sorts of reasons. And it could be that you've trained strata managers and the new strata manager just doesn't know that they have to register a new bylaw. Um, so all sorts of reasons why, basically. Um, and it, it affects the owners' corporations as well. So if the owners' corporation um, really does want the bylaw registered, because if it's not registered, then the obligations of the lot owner doing the work haven't been crystallised either. So it's in both parties' interests, the lot owner and the owners' corporation, to get the bylaw registered. Okay. Fifth pro tip, 
don't be inflexible. Um, and by this, I say, you might need to negotiate the scope or the manner of your proposed works. Like I said before, you know, if, if your neighbour has concerns that, you know, they work from home on a certain day, well, if they have enough power to block their vote or they can get uh, enough other lot owners uh, to vote the same way that they vote and they block it, um, then, you know, it might be very well worth your while to take a little bit of inconvenience to say, well, we won't do noisy work on that day that you're working from home. Um, it'll affect, you know, the, the timeliness of our work, um, but at least we know that you'll vote in favour. Um, it might also be that the owners' corporation says, uh, as a condition of the bylaw, we want the work once you've started to be completed within a certain amount of time. Um, you say, okay, but, you know, what happens, as we've all seen in the last couple of years with COVID? You know, what happens if there's some sort of supervening event? Well, then, Put it in the bylaw that if there's something that's outside your scope or control um, that you then get the extension of time so think how you can work with your other lot owners basically in a collaborative way um, so that you can resolve as many of their concerns while still getting what you need so a bit of a win-win approach okay i've given you a couple of real life examples on the way through i'm going to give you two more these are actual cases um, and I look, there's two different uh, approaches that happened from these cases. The first one was um, strata plan number 75506, and it was an industrial scheme. Um, one lot was sold, and it was sold to a religious organisation that then decided that they would gut the lot, install a mezzanine level, and install a whole heap of new bathrooms, uh, and make, do other work, basically, so that they can convert this industrial, basically a, a factory shed, um, into a, a mosque or a prayer hall. Um, the works were never approved. Um, the owners' corporation commenced the proceedings in NCAP, and they wanted orders that the works be removed and the common property be reinstated. And NCAP decided in the owners' corporation's favour. Now, the works that were done were really extensive work. It was done to a, a, a high standard of finish, um, although in this particular case, there was no, um, no uh, certification as to the waterproofing. And there was a few queries about the structural effects of some of the work, but just the very finishes, the, the tiling, uh, the fixtures that had been put in. Um, they were all top quality, even if perhaps the underlying work was not. Um, so it was an expensive process to do the conversion. Um, I've put in a quote there from senior member Charles, um, and I think it's a really good quote because he's saying essentially that unauthorised work is a serious matter and that there are um, strict controls because if there aren't these strict controls, which is the approval process, it can endanger the structural integrity of the building. And that's why there's a very good reason why you cannot add to, alter uh, or erect a structure on the common property without um, a, uh, a bylaw uh, and without complying with section 108 um, and section 111 of the Act. So it is important to get it done. Um, in this case, there were works orders um, made and the lot had to basically be put back to its pre-work state, which was a super duper expensive process. Um, one, to do the work in the first place. Two, to then undo all of that work and to reinstate the common property. The second example with Owners Corporation 22607, um, slightly different approach um, and this was senior member Simon. And I've deliberately chosen some older cases, one from 2017, which is the last case, and one from 2018. Um, and that's about when you started seeing the really contested decisions coming through after the, um, the amendments to the Act in, uh, came into effect in 2016. These, this just tells you this is the tribunal's approach and has been for a long time uh, for unauthorised work. So in this case, Ms Yang did the work, didn't have authorisation. Um, her argument was that um, she should only have to provide a common property rights bylaw to authorise the work and be issued a small fine and then all was good. Um, why? 
she said she did the work. Well, it was really interesting because she said she only completed the work because her owner's court was difficult and they sought to charge her to have a meeting to consider a proposed authorisation of the work. Um, she also argued that the work did not adversely affect the common property and that the owner's corporation hadn't demonstrated that the work that she'd done was defective. Well, the tribunal wasn't having a bar of it, quite frankly, and said, well, it's not up to the owner's corporation to prove that the works were defective or that they were detrimental to the common property. Um, all they needed to prove was that the work was unauthorised. Um, and they made orders um, slightly in the lot owner's favour, but that she at her cost was to provide a common property rights bylaw um, to the owner's corporation and that the owner's corporation wasn't to unreasonably deny the making of that bylaw. But they did require uh, Miss Yang to also have independent expert evidence that all of the work had been conducted in accordance with the relevant Australian standards and evidence that the works didn't affect the structural stability of the building. Now, if Miss Yang didn't do that, then she had to remove all the work at her cost and restore the common property to its previous state. Um, so we get to the point where, look, you might be lucky, you might be able to negotiate a bylaw with your owner's corporation. Um, bear in mind that your owner's corporation is probably a little ticked off with you at this point. Um, and there will be lots of stress. Um, there will be some further delays uh, and potentially a lot more money spent. Um, ultimately, if it goes to the tribunal, your best case scenario if you've done unauthorised work is that you'll have an order that the common property rights bylaw um, that you propose um, in the proceedings might be made or that you get an order to go off uh, and to put a common property rights bylaw to the owner's corporation and that they can't unreasonably refuse it. Um, and the owner's corporation, you know, not being able to unreasonably refuse the making of any bylaw, that just reflects the current situation. So that's not a win. That's literally just reflecting what's there. Worst case scenario is if you do unauthorised work, you might get an order saying that you have to remove the work at your cost and reinstate the common property at your cost. So it can be a really expensive process. Um, now, I always try and do this. Um, if you can see the screen at the moment, you can see two beautiful fur babies who I have bribed heavily this session. Uh, usually they are underneath my feet. Uh, they have been bribed heavily to be shush because uh, they were having a little bit of a barkathon immediately before we started. Um, so I do try and get them into every presentation. I'm still trying to uh, see how I can make them tax deductions to be my office little helpers. Um, treats are expensive, you know. Um, so happy to answer any questions. Uh, if the first question is, who's the, who's the big boy, who's the little boy? White schnout is Melvin. Um, big boy is Ollie Dogosaurus. So happy to answer any questions, guys. Our contact details are on the back of the slide if you'd like to contact me. Um, that will be provided to you as part of the recording. I'm just going to stop sharing the slides now and you'll get Nikki and myself and we'll go through some of the questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Alison. And we will share your contact details with the email that we send out later today as well so everyone can get in touch with you that way. But thank you so much for the clarity and the detail that was provided in that presentation. It was it was fantastic. It was um, a really great session for all of our viewers. We had lots going on in chat during that session. You probably, I don't know whether you had a chance to see that, but we had. I, I could, it just stopped counting at 99 <laughs> plus. So we'll try and get to, to as many and try and give us as much detail as we can. And perhaps I think that some of them are probably going to be a bit repetitious. Let's try and get through some of them for you. Okay, that sounds great. What we might do, we did have questions that were sent in by our audience. So we've got those and Alison has gone through them and she's provided responses. But we had a few questions that came in that were probably relevant to the presentation that you did and just asked, seeking a little bit more clarification on some of the points. So we might jump to those really quickly first, if that's okay, and see how we go with those. So uh, one of the questions was, um, and I thought this was interesting because we have had lots of talk um, on the site about electric car charges. So Yvonne was asking, where do electric car charges fall if an owner wants to install one in their garage? Yeah, and that's, I've actually had a few of these questions and queries in my own practice as well. So this is a really difficult one. You need to actually get um, your people that are looking at installing it to go and have a look at the common property meter board. Um, a lot of the times I'm finding that the meter boards may need to be upgraded, particularly if you're looking at an older building. 
And as soon as you do that, you're talking common property. Um, it's not just as simple as, you know, plugging your car into the wall um, because of the power that comes through. You also need to have a think about how are you actually um, powering that. So a lot of people in townhouses are wanting to have solar panels um, and then have the solar and a battery and then plug the car in and have this lovely um, system. So what sort of system are you going to be using? Um, are you just going to be pulling electricity straight from the grid? Are you going to want to install a, a solar panel or a battery of somehow? Uh, because they're all kind of factors that need to, to go in. Now, um, an EV charger is actually a, a sustainability infrastructure motion. So technically, you should only use or only need 51% of unit entitlements to say yes because of that special resolution change. It depends on what other work you want to do with it. If you just keep it to all the sustainability infrastructure work, um, then it should be a 51% resolution to pass your bylaw. Um, but there's there's lots of factors at play with these things. Um, if it is just a simple, you know, you've got an up-to-date modern power board um, and all you have to do is make sure the wiring in your, scheme, in your garage, um, and it is a garage, so you can pull it down so we're not changing the external appearance of your lot. Um, we don't have to secure your charges so that nobody can sneak into your car space and plug their own in. Uh, because that's another consideration as well. Um, it's a lot easier if it's a it's just an EV charger, modern power board, um, and then all you need is the um, resolution to um, pass a bylaw to approve it for your scheme, for your specific um, garage. If you're talking about EV chargers that are going to go on the common property, so in shared cars parking spaces, um, how are they going to be? Um, charged or how is the power draw going to be charged? Is the owner's corporation going to be paying for that electricity use um, or is there some way of metering it? So I've got my car charged, you know, or being charged. Um, I'm going to pay for that. Um, and then Joe Blow next door, they're going to charge their car and they're going to get a bill for doing that as well. Um, so you need to kind of think through some of these considerations too. Are there going to be rules about if it's a common um, or in a common area, who can use it, how long they can use it. Um, are there rules about, you know, some cars, and I, I'm looking into a hybrid myself, actually, um, although I'm a wee bit scared because I have heard a story of somebody, you know, driving up from Newey, Newcastle, uh, to Coffs in the rain at night, and they only got as far as Port Macquarie before it decided it didn't want to go anymore. Um, so, you know, they then had to take a motel and charge it overnight because it was a slow charger. You know, you're getting slow charges, fast charges, different power draws. So I probably haven't answered the question with as much specificity as you'd like. Um, but if it is just a simple your garage, you can pull the door down. It's just you using it. You've got a modern power board. Get a bylaw motion, 51% resolution. That's all you need. If it starts getting a bit more complex, if it's in a, um, a shared area, you have to try and lock it down. Um, so it's your car space, but it's affixed to a common property wall and only you want to use it. Well, then you're probably going to want to have some way of locking it off. Um, and it's also going to change the external look and appearance of your lot. So bylaw again. Um, but again, it's a, it's a special resolution, but at the 51% level. So hopefully that helped. Okay, thank you. And are you finding the committees that are getting those coming through, are they dealing with them on a case-by-case -case basis or is it starting conversations within those committees to look at doing it um, on a broader scale across the whole building? Well, I'm, I'm actually trying to encourage people to look at it from a broader scale uh, because if one person wants to do it, people, other people are going to want to do it at some point in time. And it kind of doesn't make sense to me that while the EV and the hybrid car users it's so low why you wouldn't just have one sort of common or two common. Um, I think once it gets to the stage where we've all got electric cars, well, we're all going to need charges basically. Um, but at this stage, you know, why not get a couple of common ones? Um, could you make it a bit of a revenue draw, a service that your owner's corporation is providing to its lot owners by agreement and an owner's corporation can do this and then say, okay, well, we're going to then charge you for the provision of this electricity uh, and, you know, excellent. But there are providers looking at doing that sort of thing now. Um, so, but other schemes, they're still really reluctant, particularly where you've got to upgrade the electricity system um, because it's going to be a big problem for the meter boards. Um, if you've got old wiring, oh, there's a lot of schemes still out there with the old vulcanised rubber. 
Um, and, you know, that's obviously, that's an issue. You couldn't have a, an EV charger in those sort of schemes. Mm. Yeah, we've certainly been encouraging committees um, to go out there and, and at least make some provision for it in their maintenance plans or start thinking about it because I think it's something that they have to do. They'll have to do eventually anyway. So yeah, now's the, now's the, the chance. Yeah, okay, that's great. I think one of the things too with that is where's the room, you know, set aside the room to be able to do this. Mm. So some schemes don't have it, unfortunately. Mm. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Um, Okay, we're also asked by Robert, uh, when seeking renovation approval, can I vote on my own bylaw? Yep, you can. So um, the difference would be if you were asking for a minor renovation and it was the strata committee deciding it um, and you were a member of the strata committee. So if you're doing it that way, well, the strata committee, if you have a pecuniary, which means monetary interest in a motion, you can't vote on it unless you disclose your interest and the rest of the committee say that you can. So provided you did that um, and the committee said, yeah, look, you can vote on it. Um, you can vote on your motion as a strata committee member for a minor innovation because every single lot owner has an interest in a bylaw motion or any motion that's put before the owner's court because let's face it, it's going to involve common property or money um, or something that's going to affect your rights in the owner's court. Um, you can definitely vote on your own motion. Just make okay. it financial. That's the trick, guys. Make sure you're financial. Uh, John was asking, uh, is it a six-month limit for a bylaw to be registered or to be lodged for registration, noting that it still has to be registered before it's effective? That's a really good um, pick up, John. It is to be lodged. So provided you've got it lodged within that six months, the LRS can take two years and a day, as far as I'm concerned, uh, to register it um it's just it's the lodgement date so you just got to get it in it is easier now it's all via PEXA and it's electronic um but the LRS is still or, or can still be a little bit picky um about things uh, we kind of we shouldn't probably say this online but I will um it, it seems to depend on which clerk you get on the day quite frankly sometimes you, you just get a whole run of requisitions um other times and it's all by the same clerk um all on the same day um and other times you know things will go through smoothly and you'll get stuff registered really quickly under PEXA um so the, the registration process is definitely shorter um and you're right it's the lodgement it has to be within the six months okay great uh Josh asked are floating floors considered minor or cosmetic if there's nothing in the bylaws um already gotcha um, there is under minor renovations, um, removing or, or doing works to timber or hard surface flooring. Um, and so you need to have a look at your particular strata plan. A lot of schemes have flooring that's in place as at the date of registration strata plan. Um, and that is where the, the common property lot limit boundary is. Um, other older schemes have obviously had that. Um, and then flooring has been replaced over time. Uh, and so you might have flooring on top of flooring and the top level might actually be lot property, but the bottom level might be common property. Um, if, you, if it is the top level and it's lot property, you're good to go, but you need to make sure you're not affixing it or driving it into the common property. Um, so it's a bit of a complicated situation, that one. Um, floating floorboards often are, um, affixed somehow and I know they're called floating floorboards but they're not necessarily just sitting on top so okay thank you and uh, we had one from Adam asking uh, what is the liability of a lot owner who has purchased a property with renovations that were unapproved oh I have had this several times over um, and recently too the problem is um, you as the lot owner are responsible, even if you didn't do those work. Um, if I was in your situation, I would be negotiating with the owners corporation to get a retrospective works by law through. Um, I, I literally, the, the example that came to mind is um, a lovely lady came to me. Um, the people before her had um, a sunroom that they converted into a kitchen and then moved, you know, the structure of the lot around. Um, and, you know, it, it was pretty obvious that it used to be a sunroom, to be honest. Um, so she, if she had have looked when she went in there and thought about it, 
she would have known, given the age of the building, that there was no way that new kitchen had been in place as at the date of the registration of the strata plan. It was very, very modern. And this was a, you know, an old, old building. Um, so there was the first clue to have a look at. Um, and just as an aside, what I'd do if I was buying into a scheme and I was inspecting, I'd always be having a look at the fixtures and fittings, figuring out, oh, is this, does this look new? Um, and then going to the bylaws to check to make sure it was approved because I don't want the liability um, if the work wasn't approved. I just don't want the grief with the owner's call. Mm. Um, but yes, unfortunately, you will be liable. Um, and I would be negotiating with the owner's corp to get in a bylaw. Okay. And would you recommend strata reports before people purchase? Is that something that you recommend? Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. But don't just get them. Read them, guys. Read them. Um, you know, flags for me would be waterproofing being mentioned, defects being mentioned, NCAT being mentioned. Um, I've got no issues if a scheme has had defects or had water problems. But what I'd then be wanting to see is that work has been done or that there's money in the bank for the work to be done to repair that problem. Um, so I, I don't shy away from buildings with defects. Um, I sound like I'm a you know multi-million property lot owner. Uh, it's not the case. Um, but I wouldn't shy away from it as long as I can see that there's money to cover the cost um, or that there's um, a rectification has been done. So always do the strata reports, read them. Don't just get them. Okay, good, good advice, I think. <laughs> uh, okay, we had one from Amanda asking what happens if council have approved works in a strata scheme, but not the owners corporation, and in this case it was for a carport, uh, what can we do? Well, the owners corporation really does need to be approving that because the carport may be on their common property. Um, you technically can't do work. It's, it's like if I owned a house, and I just decided that I want to go and do work on the next door neighbour's um, front lawn and I wanted to build a, a car park port there I'm trespassing I can't do that um, so if the carport is on the common property and it might not physically the footing for it might not be on the common property um, but the roof may be in the common property airspace um, technically that's a trespass council may have approved it um, but the owner's corp still needs to approve it um, if you can I, I look I, I always try and stay away from uh, the fights, if I have to, why? They're stressful. They take time. They take money. Um, but if you have to, um, make darn sure that you set yourself up for success. Um, if you don't have to, if you can get a situation where everybody can live with it um, and they take responsibility potentially for the bylaw uh, or for the carport, you get a good bylaw in place. Um, if they're taking any part of the common property, um, ask them for some compensation um, for the owners' corporation not having the exclusive use of that part of the common property anymore, that might be a good solution as well. Mm. But OC has to approve it. Okay. And probably just one more from uh, during the chat. We've we had other questions come up, but I haven't had a chance to look at those yet while we've been talking. But just for now, Nicole's asked, are blanket bylaws for, say, um, something like air conditioning a good idea for plans or are they possible pitfalls and it should be on a case-by-case -case basis? I personally don't like them, but... I'll, you know, stick the hand up. I'm a strata lawyer. I've got bias. Um, you know, it, it is in our interest to draft bylaws, um, for instance. So we do do them, but where I do them, I, my advice is to make them as specific as possible. So there's as little loophole as possible. So we do do them, definitely. Um, and I've even done the blanket bathroom bylaw works, but I always define the works as tightly as possible um, so, you know, for a blanket bathroom one, or you can take um, out the existing tiles, take out the existing waterproofing, you can take out the existing fixtures and fittings, but you can't do anything structural. You can't um, start cutting chasings through the walls um, or the floors. You can't do any drainage holes. You can't take any structural walls. So everything has to stay in the same place. You can just put in new stuff. Um, it'd be the same with the air conditioning. Yes, I'd say do it but try and put it as in, in as specifically as possible to say, well, where are the air conditioning condensers going to go? Um, are you going to leave it for the strata committee to approve where they go? Or are you going to say, or are you able to say, here's a specific area in each lot where they must go if you're going to do it? Um, and that just saves some disputes later on. If the, if the AC condenser is in a spot where it's visible, what colours um, are going to be acceptable? 
do you need to have some sort of um, shield around it so it doesn't change the aesthetics of the building? So think through some of those things. Um, if you don't know if it's going to be different for every single lot um, as to where you could put these things, well, then you're probably looking at a more um, one-off bylaw, quite frankly. Um, okay. Not always a cookie cutter scheme where you can do that. Mm. And I'd imagine you'll say if you're going to get a blanket bylaw, definitely get it written up by <laughs> absolutely. Well, it's, mm. it's the little things that'll trick, you know, give you trips and traps. So, um, you know, people often want to put in there that you can change the location of the toilet. Well, okay, but that's a core hole through the the slab. That's structural work. Too many people doing that, and you're going to have core holes where you might not know in 10, 20, 15 years time. Um, and it's all affecting the structural integrity of the building. Um, so absolutely, um, if you're going to do it, get it get it done properly. Okay, great. All right, we had um, a question come in. I've just picked a few of them out that were really good. We'll get back to everyone or as many people as we can if we don't get a chance to cover questions um, today in the session. But one of them came in from uh, Anita and it was, is there a time limit for when you can conduct minor renovation works that were approved via the Strata Committee? So I completed the major works in 2021. I also had written approval for the minor works, replacement of the kitchen at the same time. But due to COVID and lack of funds, I haven't yet completed completed that part of the renovation. Do I need to ask for approval for these minor works again or does the approval still stand? Do I need to provide the owner's corporation with written notification leading up to the work? And all of the electrical and plumbing works have been completed. I just need to install the cabinetry. Can you guide me where this information is in the legislation? Okay, so this is all covered under section 110 um, and subsection 3 of the Strata Schemes Management Act. Um, so depending on what your, the terms of the approval was um, or were, I should say, so you might have had approval to do the work, but it had to, once commenced, be finished within a certain amount of time. If that was the term of the approval given, so go back through your meeting minutes, go back to see what your strata manager told you, then you're going to have to go through the approval process again. But if all you're doing is installing cabinetry, I would say that that would be akin to um, installing or replacing a built-in wardrobe uh, and shouldn't need, that should come under the cosmetic work if that is literally all you were doing. Um, so you might not need approval if that is literally all you're doing is just putting in the new cabinetry. Um, so ha have a look first of all um, at the, the terms of the approval and then really just think what is the work you're going to be doing um, is it going to be just putting in the cabinetry in which case I, I would say you know, it, it's something like installing or replacing a building wardrobe um, okay work and you can go ahead and do it excellent that's great Anita was here in the session and she's just commented to say thanks so much it literally is just covered so hopefully okay, that helps. You go. Yeah, wonderful. Excellent. That's that's good. Um, okay, we had one from Karen saying, uh, recently we had a lot owners shower warding, waterproofing membrane fail. As this is original, the owners corporation covered the costs of repairs to the shower only. The owner asked permission and was granted approval to renovate the whole bathroom at the same time. Approval was given, but no bylaw has been drawn up. My question is, are the owners corporation still liable to repair the shower membrane in the future, even though the bathroom was renovated by the owner and should a bylaw be drawn up yep you should be getting a bylaw for that um absolutely so an original shower membrane um waterproofing is generally always the owner's corporation's property so common property um at the time when the lot owner wanted to do the reno to their bathroom you should have had a bylaw for that and one of the terms the bylaw should have been that the lot owner takes responsibility into the future for any work that they've done and part of the work is going to be that they're going to replace the waterproofing as a part of their renos. And that would have been a nice, tidy, it's their issue now. Um, I would be putting it back to the lot owner to say, look, we gave you approval, but we didn't actually approve it under the Act for your bathroom. Um, we need to get a bylaw done. Um, here is a proposed bylaw. Um, are you happy with it? And I'd be putting in the bylaw that they are now liable. If they did the shower membrane work, they're liable for it. And there's two reasons I do it. Is one, they if they did the work, they are going to be the ones to have engaged the contractor. Um, and so they will have the statutory warranties under the Home Building Act for that. Um, and they'll have the warranties under the waterproofing work. Um, so it's it's 
easier for them um, to take action if there is a waterproofing fail um, in the future. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Hopefully that will help with that one. Um, we also had another one that came in from Adam saying, how does the design practitioners change changes affect where two lots are carrying out waterproofing work separately? Um, is it only when it's under the same contract? Oh, and that's a tricky question. I'm going to have to go to the Design Building Practitioners Act to look. I think, and this is only a think, if it's done separately and at two separate times, you should be okay. Um, if it's done at the same time, um, under the same contract, that's definitely Design Building Practitioners Act. Um, but that one, I, I think you're going to have to get specific advice on. Um, there's also other work that could um, bring in the Design Building Practitioners Act um, and the, the need for regulated designs as well. Um, but just gut feel is um, single lots, separate contracts, different time frames. you should be okay. Um, but I, I, I would be wanting to double check that. Okay, great. Thanks, Alison. Uh, we had one, I'm just quickly checking. Uh, okay, Kim has asked, my question refers to a block of six units that was built in 1970. One unit owner now wants to renovate her bathroom. As she's not happy with having to pay for the bylaw on her own, she has questioned why four other units in the block did not have bylaws done in the past before having these renovated. These four lots had their renovations done more than 10 years ago and before the current owners brought into the bought into the block. Should the four new owners have had their bylaws done? Well, they were very naughty, um, need a smack over the wrist. And yes, they should. Um, one, to pass over the responsibility for the work to those specific lot owners um, and to take you know, the, the common property work away or, or common property waterproofing away from the owner's corp. Um, so yes, they should have. My suggested compromise is that the owners corporation gets a, in this case, blanket bylaw done um, and all of the lots in the scheme get, whether if they've done the work, retrospective approval, if they want to do the work, approval for the future work. Um, and that seems to be a fair way to go in this situation. Okay. Um, but, and as it's coming up to 10 years, some of those might want to renovate again. Um, absolutely. And, yeah, to, yeah, do something else in the future. So, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, okay. So, Ryan had asked, um, as part of a kitchen renovation, we're looking to remove a load-bearing wall within our apartment and replace it with um, structural steel beams. Mm -hmm. Will this require a complying development certificate mm -hmm. and the necessary Class 2 compliance declarations from the architect, engineer or builder? And does the declaration need to be provided by someone who has class two who is class two registered uh yes i think you're going to need a complying development certificate i'd be checking with um council um, and i'd be checking with your builder about that but i believe you're going to which then brings in the required certificates Thanks for joining us for this educational session. If you gained value from the information, please like this video. You can also engage further with Look Up Strata by subscribing to our YouTube channel or by being kept informed about Strata news via our regular newsletters. Our subscribe link is listed in the description box below.